Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on collaboration and creativity in a time of crisis, an update on the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund. The Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund, or JCRIF, a $91, $91 million partnership of eight Jewish foundations and the Jewish Federation of North America, was created to address the many challenges facing Jewish institutions during the COVID-19 pandemic. JCRIF has been distributing grants and no interest loans to a wide range of Jewish institutions since April. These grants and loans were used to address emergency needs and help organizations to adapt and innovate in the face of unprecedented challenges. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from JCRIF funders and grantees who will share key takeaways about the crisis and opportunities facing Jewish institutions. And now I'm happy to introduce Felicia Herman, the director of JCRIF's Align Grant Program and the executive director of Natan to start us off today. Thank you so much, Felicia. Thanks, Tamar. And thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to Jewish Funders Network for having us back again um, to talk more about um, JCRIF and what we're learning and some of the amazing things that we've been able to help launch in the world. Um, so we, uh, JCRF has been in operation since the beginning of April. And as Tamar said, we've been making uh, grants and no interest loans to organizations really across a wide spectrum of, of Jewish communal life. Um, we're really lucky to have with us today, Barry Feinstone, who's the president and CEO of the Jim Joseph Foundation, one of the founders of JCRIF. Um, and, and Jim Joseph is a foundation that's involved with both the loans and the grants. So hopefully he'll re reflect on both of those as we go. Um, and Abby Dabler Stern, who's the director of Macomb Israel Education Lab of the Jewish Agency. Thanks for being with us late at, oh, not quite late at night, but late enough at night. It start, looks dark outside in Israel. Um, Abby, uh, one of the great things that we have been able to do through JCRIF is not just respond to applications, you know, proposals and um, from organizations, but actually to invent a few new things. And um, Abby's going to talk about one of the things that we invented, a stimulus program for gap year programs in Israel um, that really allowed um, all of the funders in the grant program to invest in a new opportunity um, that they had all been invested in before bringing people to Israel, but now uniquely was pretty much only able to happen through this one vehicle of gap years. Um, and Abby uh, has managed that for us and been on the ground in Israel. Um, so it's not technically accurate to call her a grantee. She's been our, our program director of something that we created, but I'm really glad to be able to bring your voice into this so that we can hear about the impact that some funding, that JCRIF funding, funding has had on the ground as just one example of many things that we've funded. I think in the grant program, um, we, we have maybe 37, 38 different organizations already that we've been able to fund. And in the loan program, a whole other universe of organizations. So um, it's good to be able to bring um, those voices in as well. So we are gonna talk about some lessons learned. Um, we are, we have, big thinkers who see really the whole of the Jewish community in front of us. And so an opportunity to talk about some of the ways that we see the community changing and some of the ways that the community will no doubt be changing in the future. I think all of us on this call know that we're living really through a historic transformational moment for the Jewish community and for Jewish communal institutions. And so I'm excited to be able to dive into that. So. Barry, um, if we can turn to you first, um, tell us just the story of how JCRIF came to be and why you um, at the Jim Joseph Foundation felt it was important to get involved with this effort. Thank you, Felicia, and uh, an honor to uh, <coughs> share the proverbial stage with uh, two, uh, two, two people who I admire, both as colleagues and, uh, and, and, and as friends. Um, and thank you again to JFN for putting this together and for people joining us. Um, I think I'm just going to spend the first few minutes um, just giving a little bit of background about how, how all of this got started. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for me, um, you know, the, the, the date was Wednesday, March the 4th. And that was really the date where uh, I began to confront, um, like everybody on a personal level, but also professionally, 
um, to confront the immediate threat of, of the deadly virus. Um, I was actually in Manhattan on that day, attending a gathering that we at the Jim Joseph Foundation had put together of seminary heads and others who play an active role in rabbinic training. And in the afternoon, one of the participants received a call that the father of a student at her kid's school had tested positive for the virus the previous day, one of the first known cases in the region, and the school following the advice of state authorities um, had decided to close. Uh, the next morning, I woke up, took an early flight back to San Francisco, had really no idea what was about to happen, but I guess you could say that my, my gut, my, my kishkis, if you will, told me that this was going to be different. Um, it actually turned out that uh, one of the members um, who was in that convening actually you know, sent an email to the group seven days later saying, hey, by the way, I tested positive. I, I'm doing fine, but you should get checked. Um, thankfully, nobody else in the group um, tested positive. Um, but that story that I had, um, it turned out that my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Lisa Eisen, Eisen of the Schusterman Foundation, and Mark Charendorf of the Maimonides Fund had experienced, had experienced similar stories. Um, and in a matter of days, um, it would be fair to say that we, it would be no exaggeration to say that we were talking multiple times a day um, in very intense discussions that I think only close colleagues and people who trusted one another could have. Um, I would say that, you know, for the first few weeks of, of, of brainstorming this, it was almost like we had seconded ourselves from the day-to-day -day running of the foundations that we have the privilege to, to, to an honor to run um, and to focus on what we, what we knew was going to be a, a, a major emergency. Uh, swiftly, we agreed on three major points. One, uh, no matter, regardless of the significant means that all of our foundations have at their disposal, um, it would not be sparked and would just actually have a less than desired effect to go alone. We had coordinated before, but now we needed to seriously collaborate and trust one another. Two, we needed to move fast and be nimble, not necessarily a major strength of the funding landscape. Um, that might be a pretty big understatement. And three, we needed to focus. We needed to quickly understand what gaps we could fill regardless of the assets, again, trying to be all things to all people would just not be possible and it would also not be smart. And so we quite quickly came to the conclusion that we should focus on a segment of the Jewish world that at least we had deep knowledge of. Um, and, and I wanna stop there for a second and just say that, um, that we recognized that there were multiple needs that were in the community. We were not going to be able to take care of all of them. We were, but we were one slice of pizza in an enormously large pie. And it made sense for us to actually at least begin to get involved in the areas where our foundations overlapped and where we had some sense of knowledge. So what that was, you know, the field of formal and informal Jewish education. We knew the landscape. We knew the leadership in the field of schools and camps and youth programs. We understood to some degree the needs of the constituents. And most importantly, I think we had relationships with the key intermediaries in this field, um, representing the fact that the, the Schusterman Foundation, the Maimonides Fund, and the Jim Joseph Foundation are to a large extent national funders. And we had these relationships with these national intermediaries. From there, and after you know, several iterations, um, and I think I'll just say at that point, we realized that we could have kept iterating and made this better, but we also realized that we didn't have the time and luxury. And we quickly agreed that trying to perfect something was not going to be a good idea, um, but, but being good enough was going to be good enough. Uh, so in record time and you know, dozens and dozens of legal documents, we got going. What was created was fundamentally a never before partnership um, amongst the three of us led to the creation of JCRIF, um, which has grown to represent, as Tamar um, indicated, eight foundations and a pot of more than $90 million. We decided early on that it would be most effective to offer interest-free loans to qualified beneficiaries. We'll talk more about that a little later, with up to four years for the recipients to pay back. The intent there was to invest in institutions that are being hit hard, but were fundamentally sound. We wanted to help them weather the storm. Again, we were not trying to solve for the long term. 
we were in an ex in some respects um, an extension of PPP loans. What would happen at the end of that? Um, we knew we couldn't solve all the problems, but if we could give them the funds, that would get them through it, hopefully. We soon also realized that some of the vital institutions need immediate help to survive and that loans were not going to be the right fit. Um, and there were also new partners and collaborations that we were perhaps thinking about. And so we also seeded the grant side of things with an additional $20 million. It is true to say that all of the foundations who are partners in this each had to give up a piece of themselves for the greater good. Again, not something that we normally would do. Each of us have theories of change, of things that we're trying to do to seed the, the type of Jewish community that we want. But we each had to be comfortable in allocating funds to perhaps some, are, some arenas that we don't normally fund. Um, for instance, the Jim Joseph Foundation does not have a, a, track, a long track record of funding individual synagogues. And, the, and there are you know, dozens of synagogues that are receiving uh, grant, uh, loans through, our, through JCRIF. Um, we realized, though, it was time that we couldn't do business as normal. This was the rainy day. In fact, as I said at the GA the other day, it wasn't raining, it was absolutely pouring. And, and being from Scotland, I know, what it, I know what it looks like when it's pouring. The loan fund to date has, given over, has approved over $50 million in loans with the remaining $20 million in the pipeline. And the grant, grant fund has given around about $15 million already. And, and, and that has gone to both shore up some institutions and also see new collaborations and programs, some of which you'll hear about shortly. Um, it has been, I, I have to say that, you know, it's always nice to receive some accolades for what we put into motion. But the reality is that JCRIV, like all big and hopefully good ideas, require a ton of work by a ton of people. And I think it's important to mention, you know, what that took, N not by way of thanking these people, of course, that's important, but by way, by way to give people an understanding of the breadth of buy-in and that, that, that we had to get. Um, how are we going to administer all of this? Um, well, on the loan side of things, that would not have happened without um, Shira Hutt and Daron Kentner and a team of people at, uh, at JFNA and members of, of the different foundations. Um, and on the grant side of things, none of this happens without Felicia um, and her ability to second herself from her day job to get the, you know, to get this done. The boards of all the of all the foundations that are represented had to act in manners that they perhaps have never acted before. They built muscles, changed normal philanthropic practices, kept focused on helping those in need, and did so in record time. They moved rapidly. They got involved in things that they'd never got involved in before, like loans, and which was pretty new to most of us. Um, and all of the originating players of this, the Mandel Foundation, the Wilf Family Foundation, the Aviv Foundation, the Glazer Foundation, the Singer Foundation, um, you know, everybody gave up a bit of themselves in order, you know, to get this done. And then I'll just finish um, this part of it by just saying that um, the biggest kavod actually goes to the recipients of the money. Um, you know, they are working tirelessly. They are the, the Jewish version of the energizer, of the energizer bunny. The, the, the amount of effort and work that is going on there so that Jewish education, both formal and informal, um, you, know, uh, you know, you often talk about, uh, you know, um, you know, we talk about heroes an awful lot, and 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 I got to say that people that are working frontline, people that are working, you know, with our children, um, with our grandchildren, you know, with it, it really is remarkable. And for the for the funders to have the ability to actually give money out is really just an amazing thing. So I'll stop there and uh, pass it on back to Felicia. Well, let me actually pass it back to you for one more minute, because I think sure. most of what we're going to talk about is the grant program. So I wanted to give you a few minutes to talk a little bit more about the loans. Um, most funders uh, don't make loans. Um, so I just wonder if you could tell us what was the thinking behind the just the invention of the loan program altogether. And it started, the idea really started with loans. The grant program came second, I think, in the ideation. So why loans, why no interest loans? And then can you just tell us a little bit about where those loans have gone and really to kind of what kinds of institutions have been able to benefit from the loan? Yeah, 
Yes, for you know for sure. So the the thinking behind well the the thinking behind the zero interest was you know that was kind of like the no brainer, right? That was like look, we're not gonna you know we're we're not in this to make money, right? I mean that would just be uh, you know that 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 would be ridiculous. And um, so the you know the the obvious question is well why not just give the seventy million dollars out in grants, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is a completely legitimate question. And what we wanted to try and do was a, a couple of different things. First of all, wanted to recognize that that $70 million was one piece of an ecosystem, okay? That there were many organizations that were actually going to get grants, either through local, through local federations and other philanthropies. And I think, and I'm sure a lot, of this, a lot of the people on the call are aware of this because I know it's something that JFN talks about an awful lot, while the big, large philanthropic foundations get an awful lot of press, we represent about 20% of the total giving capacity that exists in the Jewish community, right? Um, so, you know, we knew that that money would hopefully flow anyway. And another reason why we went down the loan road was, remember, this was April. Um, we had no crystal ball. We, we didn't know if this thing was going to hap- be done, you know, in a couple of months or whether we are where we are now, which is about to enter into what, you know, is going to be, I think, a pretty dark winter um, with regards to the virus. And so the notion of um, keeping some powder dry, if you will, recycling money so that when loans come, you know, loans go out, they come back. Um, And then also, you know, recognizing that there is undoubtedly going to be some level of default, right? We, you know, we we understand that. And then the third thing I would say is, again, it's a moment in time, right? And they also have to remember that when this was all happening, um, you know, all all the philanthropies around are all looking at their assets and their assets, you know, dropped by 25, 30%, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and so there was this sense of, well, you know, what happens if it drops 50% or something? We didn't know. So that's kind of some of the background on that, on, on why loans, which, by the way, in the secular philanthropic world and in a couple of places in the, in the Jewish philanthropic world, um, you know, they are, they are relatively common. Um, so we, we weren't experimenting with something that hadn't been done before. Who got, who's gotten the money? Um, you know, uh, you know, I can speak in very, you know, just real terms. Um, you know, the, the, the main kind of pillar institutions that we, that we focused on were around camps, schools, JCCs, synagogues. Um, we apportioned out, um, you know, how much money we would set aside for each of these arenas. And then we had to figure out very quickly a system whereby we would not just get inundated with like, thousands of applications. And that wasn't because we were scared to be inundated with applications. It was about, there was no way that we would be able to get the money out the door quickly. And I have to give a plug here and a serious plug here for something that has become a little bit of a, um, a punching bag, right? Um, in, in, in the Jewish community over the last 15, 20 years, which is the role and import of intermediaries, mm-hmm. right? And there is no way that we could have done this well, let me rephrase that. We could have done it. There is no way that we could have done it as expeditiously and hopefully as smartly without the Foundation for Jewish Camp, without the JCC Association, without Prisma in the day school world, because they helped work with their field and presented us with slates. They, you know, they, they did a tremendous amount of work and they're still doing it. So, you know, about 30, 40, you know, plus or minus about 45, 50 million dollars has gone to synagogues and JCCs and camps and schools. Um, and then a myriad of other um, intermediaries, you know, Hillel International has received and Chabad on campus has received, you know, etc. And then a few kind of individual organizations. Great. You know, that that issue of the intermediaries is going to be a fast and I, I can't wait to read the book about this period, you know, in 10 years, um, because the shift in the role of intermediaries is going to be such an interesting one that some of those intermediaries were set up to play that role when we went into this, some of them were not, and they all have really adapted the role that they've played. And I, I you know, the same is true for federations, right, and, and for JFNA. Also, everyone is really shifting. So, all right, well, let's get into the grant program. And let's make sure that we get Abby's voice into this. So just to give a little bit of background to the grant program overall, 
Um, the, one of the differences between the loan program and the grant program is that the, in the loan program, the seven funders who are in the loan program make decisions together. They all agree um, or, or don't agree on particular decisions. In the grant program, it's an aligned grant program. We have five funders in the grant program um, and they each make individual decisions. Um, so in the beginning, we made a handful of emergency grants um, that still represents, if you were to look at the total amount that we've given out so far, the, the first tranche of emergency grants is still the biggest amount of money, sort of total amount of money out of everything that we've done, that we have big grants to the day school universe, um, to the camps, um, especially to camps that were also serving as retreat centers, so playing a double function in the community. Um, a little bit to JCCs. Um, and that those emergency grants really enabled uh, organizations to stay operational. I would say one of the, I was just talking to another organization that we made a grant to, um, or that some of the funders made a grant to, because we, there's not, there's sort of a we, but not really a we in Jake Griff Grant Fund. Um, but another organization that said this grant came at exactly the right time for us and it's transforming our organization. So one of those timing things was also the grant, a grant we made to Prisma early on to do tuition assistance to parents really early on, just at the moment when they were making decisions about whether to send their kids to day school next year, whether they could afford to do so. So that was a, a well-timed um, emergency grant. After that first round, the grants really have evolved into um, innovation grants, um, helping organizations and sectors um, to shift the way that they do their work um, and to really give oxygen to ideas that were really taking off. So of course, you know, the, the big bucket here is around digital, the shift to digital um, and enabling some of the organizations um, that were starting to see big numbers like a Hadar, right? That was seeing much bigger numbers for its online programs than it ever could have seen in, in person. Um, to give them additional money to expand to programs for families and kids, which is exciting. Um, we've made, we made a, a grant to 70 Faces Media to start a hub that's about to launch soon. Um, that will be a kind of a Netflix for online Jewish education. You'll have your Hadar channel, your Hartman channel, your something else, your something else. You'll be able to watch one lecture here and another thing there and a program there um, that will hopefully expose a much larger um, group of people to all of this tremendous content that's out there. Um, we did a lot of grants for high holiday programming, helping organizations to move that, to move their high holiday programs online in creative ways. Um, and we made a lot of, we've made a, a whole other bucket of grants around people. So one of the things we've been saying from the beginning is the we have all these assets in the Jewish community. We need to make sure that whatever is happening to our system, that we're trying to preserve our assets, even if the assets, you know, people thought they would be doing one thing um, and then all of a sudden their lives got upended and they found themselves either at sea or able to do new things. This is, I think, the, this is a good segue to the gap year programs. And I'll give the very personal example. As it happens, actually, Barry and I both have kids on a gap year program, the same gap year program in Israel this year. Barry's son, I think, was always planning to go on gap year. My son was never planning to go on gap year. And had he been able to go anywhere but Israel, probably would be in Italy right now on gap year. Um, but early on, we started talking to gap year programs who were telling us that they were seeing a lot of new interest from people and, um, and that they also were facing, as I'm sure Abby's going to tell us, some economic issues dealing with lockdowns in Israel. and. Um, and so we decided, the funders decided all together, this was a grant that everyone decided to do together, um, to invest in gap year writ large in Israel to fund several different programs rather than just anyone in particular. Um, and I wanna, and to have it be pluralist. And this was, this was a beautiful example of a real field-wide approach um, that we were able to take that a bunch of funders coming together to really try to shift a whole sector. So. Abby, I'm gonna turn it over to you and have you tell us the story of what that looked like from sure. your side. Sure, um, hi everyone. Um, so I'll first just start with how I got involved because I think that story of intermediaries um, is, a, is an interesting one. Um, Makom, uh, which does Israel education, um, 
for both internally at the Jewish Agency and also for, for many different organizations. Um, one of the programs we have um, is an Israel course in 24 gap year programs. Um, we teach a course on the history of Zionism, um, contemporary Israel, et cetera. Um, and so the Jacob funders called me to say, hey, you guys, you know, you must know something about gap year programs. Can you help figure out what the needs are? Um, and really from there, um, you know, I, I helped figure out what the needs are um, and, and help to, to make the, the matches um, and, and run the grant program. Um, the grant program essentially was at first to figure out what programs should we fund. There are um, many, many um, gap year programs. Um, and Jacob made the decision they wanted it to be um, predominantly pluralist programs, um, predominantly non-Orthodox programs. Um, but for the pro programs that were Orthodox, that are Orthodox, um, students who go to, um, to secular college or not, not Yeshiva University, um, because they, those are the students who need it most, um, who need the experience in it some more. And the main goal was to increase the numbers of students who could come. Um, the call that I got from, um, um, from Felicia, from Daniel Bonner at the Singer Foundation um, was in was in, in June um, and within I think it was four weeks we had um, somewhere between four and six weeks we had approved grants right the, the Jay Criff had approved grants so we got an RFP out um, we did a round of phone calls to understand what the needs were um, and and um, programs had answers that quickly um, and I'll give some quick numbers of what happened from the, in that short period um, so. I'll just say in 2019-20, of the nine programs, the JCRF ended up funding nine, nine gap year programs. Um, in 2019-20, those nine programs had 440 North Americans in their program. In July, when they applied for funding, they had 502 um, uh, students already. Um, and in September, when they reported back, once the program started, they had 570. So we're talking about 440 last year to 570 this year in, in, in just nine programs. So that was an you know really quick increase um, that was seen, which was pretty incredible. Um, I'd say six right six of the nine programs blew through the number that they had projected in July, um, and that was interesting. That was you know an amazing thing. Um, I can talk a little bit if you want about the scholarships and how the money was um, was split. Um, sure, so I mean because I think that there's a really interesting story here in this kind of grant and in all of them about what the needs were coming into this, what the new opportunities were, and then also what the new costs were that those new opportunities led to. Right, so, so we'll talk about the two main needs. Um, one was scholarships. Um, if the goal um, was to increase the number of students coming, um, among the needs that the gap year programs mentioned was people need money. Um, it's, you know, that with the economic crisis, a lot of um, families couldn't afford tuition. Um, and they needed increased scholarship dollars. Um, so the grants were all 30% went to scholarship dollars and 70% went to the other needs, um, which was just increase um, in, in budgets. Budgets skyrocketed. Um, the number one reason was for food. Um, during COVID, um, they can't serve food the way they normally do. They have to have it individually wrapped, right? We're talking about programs of, you know, between 50 and 200 you know, students that becomes expensive. Not only just how they serve it, but um, when um, they are used to going out for weekends, um, right, where the students normally go out for weekends or for all the, the high holidays and, um, and, 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 and Sukkot, when they're normally not um, at school, this year they have to be in their, in their dorms um, or in their apartments. And again, that was a responsibility on the programs to feed, feed them and house them and, and program for them. And those all increased budgets. Um, I'll show just a quick picture because um, I think it, it also demonstrates um, another need, which is um, infrastructure, um, literally the building. Um, this is a picture of someone teaching um, behind that plexiglass thing. You can see my cursor. He's teaching back there and his students are over here. They're looking through a screen right at, the, um, at a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and so that is how all the schools or most of the schools look, but they had to build those plexiglass um, dividers and they're, they're all over the place. And you know, that's a big expense. Um, so that's, that's where the money went to, it's the scholarships um, and, uh, and, and all those infrastructure costs. And I'll say the programs are worried for um, the next coming month, you know, the next few months. Um, they're, they know they've already overspent and it's gonna keep coming because every change that's made um, costs them more money. Can I, I just jump in and just yeah. like just just on that last point and and you know again well first of all you know like I said about awful lot of hard work right so we had the idea 
And the reality is without Abby, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't happen as quickly as it happens. And therefore the opportunity is missed because we were time bound, right? Um, but just on that kind of like additional expenses and, you know, I guess, you know, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm not making a pitch, but, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, just things that pop into your minds, like, you know, well, you can't, you know, buses that have 40 kids in it. Well, you can't, you can't put 40 kids in a bus to go, uh, you know, my son is uh, down in Stay Rock right this morning, right? Um, and they're getting some education about the Gaza board and whatever. Well, they would have just gone down in like two buses. I'm, I'm sure there were five buses that were needed this morning because they can't put all it. So just all the things that we know that we're dealing with here about distancing, they're dealing with uh, there and they're not, you know, they're not built for it. Um, you know, so I just want to, you know, put, put that perspective in there. So I want to stick on this, on this specific example of the gap years and Israel engagement for a minute, Israel education, Israel engagement, because I'm just looking at who's on the call. And I know we have a lot of funders who are interested in that issue generally. And of course, one of the big challenges that we are facing right now is at a time when you cannot take people to Israel generally, um, how do you do Israel education and engagement? Um, so I, you know, one of the important pieces of this story is that the reason why the kids were able to be there at all is because Masa got visas for gap year kids um, really early on. Um, and that I think something, talk about timing, if, if that had been more widely known, if we had you know, if that were sort of broadly publicized, I think we could have had even twice the number of kids who are there right now. Um, and that will hopefully continue. But, but these gap year kids in Israel are, I think, the only non-Israelis um, in Israel right now, right? Um, and I guess, Abby, it, maybe could you reflect for us a little bit about first what the experience of being there in this time, how that might be shaping their engagement with Israel. Um, but then also just more broadly, you're looking at a whole host of programs that weren't able to happen. Um, how are you thinking about Israel engagement, Israel education? Yeah. Um, so first, their experience here. I mean, I think clearly their experience here is different than it would have been another year. Um, but their life would have been different and no matter where they would be, right? And they're looking at their friends um, who did go to college in the States and many of them, many of the, the gap year students are saying, my God, thank God, I would be at home on Zoom at my, with my parents, at least here, where even when it's locked down, um, they're with their friends. In fact, my nephew, by the way, is here. My nephew is at one of the programs and I haven't seen him yet because he hasn't mm -hmm. been allowed right, to, to leave. And so the, on the one hand, their experience is they're away from home. On the other hand, they, they, they're very limited. Um, but what I'm understanding, I'll just give this as a, an example, um, Nativ um, has decided for next semester, they're actually running a, a special program for students who, can, who are studying on Zoom in, um, in, co in college in the US to bring them here so they can continue their Zoom classes and then they'll run some extra programming for them so they have the Israel experience. Um, and that's a really interesting creative way of saying, hey, wait a second, how can we offer a different sort of Israel experience than they might have had, um, but an Israel experience nonetheless. Um, and that, that's a really interesting um, innovation that's happening. Um, in terms of Israel education and Israel engagement, I mean, it's a question that um, a lot of us have been thinking through um, in the Israel space, and it's obviously very complicated. Um, I've been thinking, I mean, the, the, the framework that I've been working, working on is um, trying to figure out what primary sources we can give um, people access to um, who are not here. So when I think of Israel as the primary source, right, if you want an experience of Israel, you come to, to, to Israel, you experience it. Um, what other um, immediate non-mediated experiences um, can, or, or minimally mediated experiences can, can people have um, who aren't currently able to travel? And what kinds of educational experiences can we create that are not, that, that are less mediated? So rather than talking about Israel, how can we give them an Israel experience even when they can't come? Um, so we at Macomb, just as an example, we've been working a lot on, on music, on, on getting music and other cultural productions out um, to, uh, to, to non-Israeli audiences, um, right? Giving them different eyes to see, like I think of artists as, as um, giving different eyes to see the world. So providing those eyes to people who can't be here. Um, I know a lot of people are working on virtual tours. Um, what kinds of virtual tours and can we make those virtual tour tours really, really good? Um, it doesn't still not the experience, but it, it approximates an experience. Um, but it's, it's going to be a challenge. Um, you know, we have, we're going to have at least a year's worth of people who didn't go on birthright. Will they catch up? What will the catching up, so to speak, look like? 
Um, those are all questions that I, and we're all thinking through. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, there's nothing close to replacing, right? Getting on a plane and going. So, you know, so just like we all know that and, and park that. Um, and then, you know, you know, the opportunity, I, I think there are a couple of opportunities, right? You know, so one is, you know, are there ways to bring Israel in in a different way? Um, and, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're not there yet, but, you know, Jay Crips looking at, a, 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 you know, a, some type of, you know, filming TV thing about Israeli chefs and, you know, that, that, that we'll be able to tell you more about in a little bit. Um, but there's, a, there's also an interesting opportunity that's also surfacing, which is for, for, for so long, we've talked about how we, how we need to create a larger group of people who are working in the Jewish community to really understand how to be an Israel educator, right? And, and what we've done is like, there are, there are like a handful of people like Abby, who are just, you know, like, you know, real tzaddiks, right? Like true experts in the field. But most of the people who are working with their young people are, you know, kind of that kind of, if you want, you know, that's not their specialty. And so in this pause moment, right, in this uh, kind of Shemitah year, if you will, where we can't go, um, you know, there's an opportunity that we're also looking at to like, can we train these people, right? Because they're normally so busy or they're going to Israel or whatever, can we actually take the breath to actually give them some ro more robust um education about what it means to be an, a good Israel educator in 2020 and beyond. And, and so that's a, a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, I don't want to say a silver lining, but an opportunity that the, the moment of not getting, but I do lie awake at night, frankly, and, and worry about, you know, can people get caught up? Um, you know, that, that, you know, birthright has been, you know, just an enormous, massive experiment and this normalized experience and even we see that the, you know, the, the people who are coming to work in the Jewish community, they all had birthright experience. They all, you know, birth, birthright for many of them was like, oh my goodness. So when you take a year off and by a year, a year means like tens and thousands of young people. It's not like, you know, and then you add on. The one last thing I just wanted to say, which I think is a challenge for us is, I'm just going back to gap year is how can we normalize this increase in numbers, right? That, that's really the, you know, like, like, so we had an increase in numbers and the reality is if we'd gotten our act together even sooner and we'd done a better marketing job, I think that 600 number could be a thousand, you know, then, but how do we not go back to, because we all know, and I was, I'll finish by saying I was on a call with a Hillel professional who says like, I've got so many kids who deferred and are going in a gap year and what that does about the tenor of campus when they come back, instead of being a freshman, you know, straight from high school, they did a year in Israel and they're able to, you know, they become the real leaders in their, uh, you know, on, on their campus. So gap years are a good thing. Um, and we, we've got to keep building on that. If I can just also add one thing there, I, um, just in my conversations with Massa, um, they also, you know, have a whole program for post college. Um, and that's an also interesting um, group to be thinking about what more can we do for them. They're going to be all these college graduates who really missed out on, a, on, on you know, the great year. And then they're going to graduate and find it hard to find jobs. Um, and so can we bring some number of them to Israel and give them opportunities here? What would those opportunities look like um, in a year where finding work might be difficult? Um, and so I guess there's room for that too. Great. So I want to encourage everyone to send questions. Um, and just before we do that, I want to, Barry, just ask you one more thing. So um, one of the um, great things, I want to ask you a question about philanthropic collaboration. So I feel like the we've already talked now about two of the real advantages to having the JCRF funders coming together. One is that we have the centralized place for requests to come. So, and a um, you know, we've, there are so many disruptions just on this Israel piece, right? Once you disentangle geography from program services, you can have kids living in Israel and studying in the States. You can have them living in Israel and working in the States. You can, you can play with all these different um, elements in mm -hmm. um, many ways. So we've seen now a lot of those proposals. So there's been a real, a real advantage to, to having one centralized intake system. I think you also, Barry, you mentioned before, you keep 
bringing up the different people who have been involved with this, you know, Daron from Maimonides or Shira from JFNA. We've created dream teams, and Abby, you're part of that too. And you mentioned Daniel Bonner, like we have these dream teams around particular issue areas. That's been a huge benefit of collaboration. But just tell us, since the Jim Joseph Foundation has a lot of resources, it could be doing any of these grants individually on its own. What's the benefit to you to being part of this partnership? or some of the benefits. Yeah, yeah, look, um, so, I mean, I, I, the, my, my, I'll say this to begin, and I'll, I'll make it relatively quick. One is that um, the real benefit has yet to be seen, right? In other words, if we go back to the way we were from our, in the way that we approached our funding practices pre-COVID, that, that will be a mistake. Right. So we have to. So, you know, so this and what I mean by that is, you know, the Jim Joseph Foundation isn't going to take all its assets and do this. Right. Mm -hmm. But it but it could be taking a, a portion of it. I think what we I think what we've really learned, which I, I, I think um, is, is the real key, is that, you know, under crisis. Right. Crisis presents opportunity and under crisis, everybody has acted differently. And I think everybody has figured out and realized that they are able to actually work more efficiently when they have worked differently. And I think, you know, if you'd said to me beforehand that this would have been able to um, really make you think about doing things differently, I would have said, no, Felicia, I would have said, you know, well, this is just an emergency thing and we're going to go back. And I think pretty much everybody around the table you know, has said that that, so I think that that is unique. The other thing I think it just, you know, bears saying is that this kind of collaboration is really in the best interest of the grantee, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, I mean, just, just think about, think about the nine gap year programs. We could have all funded them individually. And what would have happened was they would have had to send a proposal to a program officer that would have blah, 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 that would have come to me, that might have had to go to our board, depending on the amount and so on. Here, we created a one-stop shop, right? And by the way, I think this is also finished with this. On the back end of it, it's also really important, which is when we give a grant, the grantee only has to make one report. They're sending a report back to Felicia and Felicia's, you know, and we've got one program officer who's representing all the foundations. Um, that, I mean, I know it sounds so simple and so, um, just makes so much sense, but it's not the way that we have functioned in the past. And um, so I think this collaboration, I think the, the, the extent of the collaboration is only, it's only to be seen down the line about really how beneficial it's going to be. You mind if I add one thing that I've noticed? Please. Um, some of the programs that you're supporting through this particular gap, through gap um, the gap year programs are too small for many of you to support individually, yep. right? You wouldn't have ever even looked at them because they're so small. Um, and so, and they would, they don't, some of them probably don't even know, like, they're just not in that league of fundraising. And so um, the, the ability to, to fold it together and say, you can now have system-wide impact without having to think about the, those individual small programs. Um, I really felt in, the, in that, um, in, in the exchanges I've had with the programs. And that's popped up in so many ways. I mean, if we talk about serve the moment, you know, which is uh, powered by repair the world, that's now a partnership of over 30, maybe even 40 organizations. And any time a collaboration like that has come through the door, it's been so worthwhile to be able to say yes to it because, you know, any of the individual funders might have in invested maybe in one of those individual organizations, but a collaboration of funders investing in a collaboration of organizations, we're just like exponentially increasing the impact. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. How do we leverage our Israeli, our Israel educators in order to help them more efficiently share culture and the Israeli experience and increase the appreciation for what they might bring to the table in our various educational contexts? Abby, do you wanna take that? Sure, I mean, I can give a quick, a quick answer, which is um, my experience of, of um, some Israel educators, um, some Hebrew, Hebrew educator, you know, Hebrew language teachers in particular is um, they, a lot of them have been in the US for a very long time um, and they're not necessarily up on the like the hip interesting culture going on um, and how can we give them access to that right um, you know teaching no me no me songs which I love and probably that's the one the one musician we can all um, you know we can all name um, they're you know what about, what about contemporary um, contemporary songs 
um, that bring up contemporary ideas. So um, trying to bring some of the contemporary stuff into, into classrooms and other settings, um, I think is one area. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I think it really depends on the setting of Hebrew teachers. You know, camp is so different than, than day schools um, and, and the training probably has to be different as well. Barry, do you want to add anything? No, I'll keep going. That was, you know. All right. So it's sticking with Israel. Uh, if a local funder is interested in the idea of normalizing gap year in Israel beyond the Orthodox community, what advice would you give to prioritizing a local investment? Do you focus on the teens, the parents? And at what age do you need to start planting the idea of knowing that at some point we'll be competing with the direct to college route? I want yeah. to take that. Um, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I, first of all, I think it's a brilliant question. Um, and, um, and it's something that, you know, on a personal level, I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about. I, I think the answer to the, you know, I think the, the, the general answer is that, um, first of all, I'm fascinated that a local community would take this on because I actually think that um, that's how we're going to learn how to do this. Like, I think the large scale thing is going to be much harder, but trial and error in different communities. And I think the general answer to your question is kind of a little bit of all of the above, right? Um, but I think the shakeup of COVID is making people question college, right? Not going to college, right? But the question of you know, whether or not do I have to go immediately, you know, like, I know plenty of people who removed their kids from college and have signed up for a local community college, right, you know, so that they can save a bunch of money, get the credit, and then when things go back to normal, right. So I think the answer to your question, Amanda, is I think it's teens, I think it's, I think it's parents, and I think there is a play around educating people um, about the import of, of, of that year. You know, the one community that has done this better than anybody else is the Mormon community, where mm -hmm. a year of service, right, is, a, you know, 95% of Mormon 18-year-olds go. Now, they're, you know, they're going on mission trips, right, to a lot to, but there's a reason why, there's also another reason why Mormon, you know, kids are incredibly successful in college, and, you know, because they're they, they've gained that year of experience, um, and you know, I'd be happy to talk offline about the topic, uh, you know, you know, further. Abby, any thoughts? The only thing I would add is just the model of Israel um, is really interesting, right? The, looking here, obviously, with mandatory army service changes things, um, or Shabbat Lumi national service, but the fact is that. Um, here, university is pushed off even more than in one year, and 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 we see amazing success. And it's like it's a really interesting thing for me as an American in Israel to be watching. I mean, wondering like how does that you know aside from mandatory service, how how um, how can that shift be made? Because it seems so obvious that it's that it's healthy to have that at least a year to to not be focused on studies in that deep way. Great, we have a good question here um, about uh, loans. Um, Barry, do you think the loans loans might get normalized in the Jewish philanthropic sector in ways that they have not been yet? What's going to happen to that money, the loan money, when it gets repaid? Um, and could it maybe become emergency and innovation capital for the community in the future? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think in general, I think um, I, I think one of the byproducts we're hoping is that the conversation about loans become a live conversation, and recognizing that uh, you know there are foundations that that, that do this already. Uh, you know that that have you know loan funds. They're mainly for capital costs for capital projects, right? Which make an awful lot of sense, right? You know, you, you raise money for a capital project, people pay off their pledges over a five year period, but you wanna get the building started. So you could go to a bank for a loan or you could get a loan from a foundation, right? And um, so the question about, you know, the innovation piece and the emergency piece, I think is a really interesting, uh, interesting one. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when the funds are repaid, the, 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 the funders will have some decisions to be made, you know, at that time about do they want to recycle them into more loans for other things? Do they want to take them back and go their own way? You know, I, I, that's that we're, we're not there yet. Um, you know, the first repayments aren't due until um, at least 12 months after the loan has been granted in recognition of the fact that people are struggling um, and all of that. But I can tell you that I'm for sure that there will be a very live conversation at the Jim Joseph Foundation about whether or not we want to set aside a, a portion of our, uh, our spend each year that could go into uh, PRIs, uh, program-related investments, um, you know, uh, you know, loans. 
I think another really critical technical thing that has emerged out of this is just the creation of that loan program. Is it an LLC? What is it very on the technical side? Like that is a vehicle that exists in the Jewish community now, a loan, yes. a, a Jewish yeah. philanthropic loan fund. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, the, the, the amount of legal work to get this, I mean, I have full of appreciation, you know, about billing hours and more so than ever before. And think about it, we, we all had to get our own attorneys to look at everything, but there is actually, you know, that expense has been set up that there actually is a vehicle um, that can be utilized for, you know, you know, for this down the line. Great. So there's a, a question in the Q&A and also um, in the chat about the day school grants. Um, and the, so the question is about, you know, I'm curious about the decision to focus on day, to day, fo focus the day school funding on the tuition assistance and not on innovation and collaboration um, since a funder supported innovation in other fields. And then Arnie brings up a great point um, that the, Here's like the background of this is that Prisma reached out after we did the emergency grants, Prisma reached out to the day school field, said, do you have ideas for different kinds of grants? And that alone set off this just flurry of activity and thinking among different day schools about ways they might work together, things they needed in the field. It taught them a lot. It taught J. Criff, or sorry, it taught Prisma a lot. Um, and the J. Criff funders didn't wind up funding any of those things. So this is a bit of a tough question. Barry, I think this is also a question about the inter the play, the dynamic between what each of the funders is doing in their day-to-day -day funding and what they're doing through JCRIF. So can you just tell us a little bit about maybe even just your thinking on the yeah, yeah no, it's it's a great, I mean it's a great question, right? So again, you know, in a collaborative way, um, you know, tuition assistance and helping get people you know, to, re to re-register or register a new for day school was an easy play for everybody. Um, and some of the more deeper stuff about innovation in the place, you know, innovation in the field was a bridge too far for some, right? Because they don't regularly fund day schools, right? So if you're not in the, I'm trying to think like, uh, so we're not in the synagogue funding business, right? But we decided that we would get into that to give loans to organizations but we're not going to get into it to fund, you know, an innovation thing in a synagogue because it's not it's not what we do. So some of these things were a bridge too far. And I also think the 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 um, the reason why the day school thing, folk, you know, also focused on tuition assistance was a little bit of a recognition that in a counterintuitive way, maybe this is an opportunity to help bolster day school enrollment yeah. um, because they are better, they are by and large, maybe better positioned to deliver an online educational experience than your local public school uh, system. And so the value proposition for day school upped itself, you know, in a kind of a, in, in, in a weird way. And we've actually seen that, you know, a little bit, um, uh, you know, around the country. Um, but, but I think, you know, some of the, I'll finish by saying some of the things that we did see, you know, for, for us, we do fund in a day school field, you know, like, these things are kind of on a shelf, right? We didn't throw them away. They just right. weren't for, they weren't for J. Criff. And I think Barry, something I feel like you said months and months ago was that part of what we're doing here is setting so many different balls in motion. And we don't, we don't know where they're going to go. Like we know that the, remember we were talking months ago about like the different phases of this, right? And like one phase of this COVID thing is months and months and months from now when some of the different sparks that have been sparked, including now new collaborations between day schools, for example, like that will come to fruition in new ways, whether J. Crick wound up funding it or not. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, and it, right. I mean, I think it's well said, you know, I, 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 I quoted recently, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine who, um, another, another Jewish guy from Scotland, who is the CEO, who I went to day school with, who is the CEO of McKinsey, right, which, you know, just makes me think about, you know, his career versus my career, right? He's, he's one of the smart. And he said in an interview recently, he said, uh, forecasting is out, dashboards are in, right? Like we're living in a moment where, you know, we can't see into the future, you know, like people say, let's do scenario planning and let's do this and let's do that. And I'm like, me personally, I'm like, that's just nonsense. It's like, you know, we've got to react to where we are now. Um, and these are the needs that we see. And, you know, it's like maybe you can see out 30 days, maybe 60, but beyond that, you know, I don't know whether or not we'll be doing this again next year. You know, I, I, who, who knows? Mm -hmm.
Great. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, any last words, last thoughts, Abby? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I, I really, to just go back to gap year, I want to, on behalf of the programs, say how meaningful it was and is um, to them. Um, the comment from one of the programs yesterday um, is that it's not just about the funding, but it was the emotional support that they felt um, when they got a phone call from someone you know they didn't know um, to say that not just personally in terms of the, the the staff who were on unpaid leave when I called some of them, mm -hmm. um, but also so that they could say to the parents, it's not just us as a program who made a decision to run the program this year, but we have you know some serious funders who are backing us as well. And that um, that shouldn't be underestimated. That it's it's not only the funds, but it's also the statement that it makes. And so, on behalf of them, I want to say thank you to all of you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go down the same path, and uh, you know, I, and, and you know, of uh, of what Abby said, and 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 what I said a little bit earlier, which is, um, you know, for all of us on this call, and for everybody, the the, the people that are doing the frontline work here are it, it's it's just if you just stop for a minute and think about what a head of school, which by the way, I think was the hardest job in the Jewish community beforehand, not because of the kids, right? Because of the parents and the donor and all this stuff, you know, just how exponentially harder that has become. And yet they are delivering in a, in a, in a way that I, I hope that um, their leadership and the leadership of so many other people that are working in the field at Hillel's, at JCC's, at camps, at schools, at synagogues, you know, it, it, if I, you know, if, if I hear people criticizing their teacher or their rabbi, I want to, you know, I want to jump up and place a wall between us and them because the, these people are just doing enormous work. And, uh, you know, that that energizes us to continue to try and find the best ways that we can to fund and, so, and, and support them. Wonderful. And I, and I want to actually put in a plug for a couple of things since this is a conversation between funders. I mean, we now have a, you can go on to the website who's um, long name, I never remember. If you Google JCRIF Jewish Together and grantees, you can see all of the things that JCRIF has funded. We also have dozens of things that we weren't able to fund, but that are excellent ideas, and we're happy to talk about them with anyone at any time. A lot of those things need follow on funding. As I said, we started many balls in motion, and those, you know, with the gap year is a great example. We really want to build on this momentum. We want to do some sort of marketing campaign or something PR. Who knows what it is, some operating expenses for the programs now so that they don't go out of business that now before we even get to next year. Um, and we really welcome the um, partnership of additional funders in that work. And just to this last point, also just something that, that Barry was saying about how amazing people on the ground have been. We, we just started to talk about ways that we could recognize heroes and rock stars in the Jewish community, you know, people who have really um, stood out in these last few months and done heroic things. So if anyone on this call is interested in talking further about that, um, it's just something that we're starting to generate. I think it would be an amazing story, um, just generally to say, like, we, we know that people are out there and um, they've really changed people's lives and um, we're just really grateful to them um, for that work. So um, with that, two o'clock on the nose, there's Tamar, just like magic. Yes, hi, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Felicia and Barry and Abby for sharing your, your wisdom and for the work that you do every day. It's wonderful to be able to hear from you how you're reflecting on this past six, seven months. And I know in the coming months, we'll have more lessons learned and more next steps. So I hope we'll be able to call on you again to learn together um, about, about this again soon. So thank you everybody for participating and we look forward to being in touch with the many other opportunities that JFN is offering in the coming weeks. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us again. Thank you all. Have a good day. Stay well. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.